So, uh, crazy times. Man, I'm sorry, again, I haven't had a video sooner. Uh, combination of a couple of things have come up. Number one, of course, all my computers are down, leaving me only the phone, and the phone decided to fall apart over the last couple of weeks. So, I've got it fixed. It's working again. Hopefully it will be working. So I now have the capacity to make videos again. And aside from that, of course, there's been all kinds of crazy shit going on. And perhaps one of the, uh, the most annoying of these things has been that I've finally figured out with a pretty good degree of confidence, 90-90% uh, confidence, that I've got cancer. Which is not really a thrill. Now that's not, I mean, it's kind of news in so much as now I'm pretty very close to certain that it's absolutely true. Where before it was merely a suspicion. Uh, however, it's not news. It's, a, it's most likely, you know, almost assuredly, bowel cancer. I'm a little bit worried that it is stage 2 or possibly stage 3 because I believe it might be affecting my liver now. Uh, but it definitely started my bowels. It probably started like 10, 15 years ago. It's been very slow going. Uh, I've had symptoms along these lines for a long time. I have been to the doctor. They completely failed to diagnose it as anything. You know, I, I went in and I said, I wasn't not sure what's going on. Here's what's going on. Uh, and there, there was concern that it would be an ulcer. Well, came clear for an ulcer. And they dropped it. You know, it was nothing else. And in fact, in, tr in typical doctor fashion, they gave me information that was exactly the inverse of the truth and prevented me from exploring the matter further for quite a long time until things got considerably worse. Uh, almost makes me wish that I could go back and sue them for malpractice. They did the same thing to my wife, and it very likely cost her her life. Uh, when she got cancer, she got breast cancer, and the information that the initial doctors gave her was categorically a lie. Now, I assume that the lie was from the, you know, heads of the hospital who told them what to think and told them what to say and not the individual doctors we were talking to. Probably, I don't think that the per individual doctors were being malicious per se. Uh, incompetent, certainly. Malicious, no. But somebody told them misinformation. That informa misinformation prevented alternative treatments that probably would have worked and, and g prevented us from finding out the truth for at least a year. And by the time we were able to work on anything uh, alternative, it was a, pretty much too late. And now it turns out those exact same doctors uh, gave me very, very bad information and failed to do their job uh, and, and gave me exactly the inverse information so that this wasn't diagnosed seven years ago when it easily could have been, seven, eight years ago. And it had been an issue since before that. So now, uh, you know, I've not been diagnosed by a doctor, nor am I going to bother to go through that dumbass, pointless process. Because normally I would say that doctor, doc, diagnostics is one of those things that doctors do well. But that has certainly not been the case in the last decade or more, so I can't really give them that. I've routinely seen them fail to diagnose major and obvious problems over and over and over again, at least over the last decade, possibly really arguably longer than that. And so here I sit in a situation where, you know, I don't have medical care, I don't have the money to throw around, I don't have a doctor, I would have to go to a doctor, have them refer to me to a specialist, that just alone would probably take six months, eight months, just to get in to see the specialist. They would want to have uh, uh, tests done, even if they got all excited and said, we got to do these right away. We're talking about four, three to four weeks before the, for the test to be done, the results to come back. If the initial tests were conclusive, which they almost never are, that would be perhaps the end of it. But probably there'd be some additional tests that need to be done. So we're really talking about... Even if I had insurance, even if I had medical stuff, we're talking about a year and maybe more for them to finally get around to diagnosing the situation, which, 
you know, I'm fairly confident what it is, and at least in my case, I have some concept of what to do in this instance. And so I don't see the point in wasting a year prolonging any activity to try to deal with this issue while the doctors pull their heads out of their sphincters. So, um, no, I'm not going to go to the doctor. Plus, there's the issue that I'm, I'm not injected. I have not taken the, you know, Puff the Magic Dragon, the Jabberwocky, the whatever you want to call it. I have not taken it. So, there's a lot of medical establishments that will deny me medical care, which is probably a human rights violation, and I kind of almost wish they would, because I would sh sue the shit out of them. And hopefully to see them face criminal charges, though that's unlikely in the current environment. Uh, on the other, but it's the thing is, you know, I, it's not like I could go into the emergency room. They probably wouldn't even admit me. And if they did admit me, there's a very good chance that they would inject me without my knowledge. You know, it has been said that at least in some, many of these places, they are now slipping some paperwork in there that says that they can do that if they wish to. Uh, and, of course, there's some places where they don't even bother with the paperwork. Some nurse who gets a, you know, a bee up her fanny comes around and, and jabs you and you don't, you know, didn't ask you, didn't ask you permission, which is, of course, absolutely a civil rights violation. You know, that that's, um, that's a violation of the Geneva, Con or that's a you know, Geneva Convention and the, uh, and the um, Nuremberg Accords. So that's, that's, that's a death sentence, or it should damn well be a death sentence, but they're doing it anyway. Um, and you know, I don't, I have no faith in having anything remotely resembling justice in this world anymore. Uh, so, you know, they would probably get, they're probably going to get away with it. So, but it means that, you know, medical services would be denied to me anyways, most likely. Uh, or, you know, and, and of course, even if I, even if they were to give me medical services, it would be contingent upon being put into an isolation ward for the nasty, evil, unjabbed people, uh, they undoubtedly decide they needed to test me. The tests, you know, would probably come back positive. So you've got to be put into the word. Now you don't have what you have. You have this other thing. It's an incompetence that uh, that staggers the imagination. These people need to be shamed, you know, publicly shamed. They should be criminally prosecuted, and I quite think a lot of them need to be put to death. You know, legally, I'm not saying go beat them up or anything. I'm saying, you know, we should have the death penalty for the level of malpractice that's going on. You know, it's murder. It's out-and-out out murder. I mean, you look at something like what's happening in New Zealand right now where they've okayed euthanasia for people who have the supposed, you know, that test positive for the thing that's going around. They can euthanize them, and they pay them $1,000 per person they euthanize. Now... Call me kind of silly, but doesn't that seem like incentive, you know, that you're euthanizing people who have something that supposedly is like a 99.6% 90, recovery rate, 99.9% .9 recovery rate, and you're euthanizing them and they'll give you a thousand bucks per person? That seems very incentivistic towards genocide. Um, so, you know, call me silly. You know, these are the sorts of things that are going on. These people need to suffer consequences for what they're doing because it is uh, it is the depth of evil. You know, we haven't seen this level of evil since World War II. Well, okay, Mao, Skidalin. You know, currently, the, the, the current Chinese regime, definitely, uh, you know, cutting people open while they're alive to remove their organs and sell them on the black market. Yeah, okay, that, 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 that rate's in there. So yeah, no, that basically the uh, medical care is out. You know, whether they refuse me or whether I don't want to bother with their incompetence. You know, I've I, I've watched them murder friends of mine. You know, where they gave them pharmaceuticals that were not relevant to their condition and could do nothing but kill them and it killed them. And it wasn't until later when I did some research on it that I found out that there was no reason that they were should have been given those pharmaceuticals it was absolutely murder and then perhaps they thought of it as a mercy killing because the people were in bad shape and they probably were going to die anyways but on the other hand it was murder unquestionably so and i've watched them do that a couple of times i've watched them you know i've watched malpractice happen again even with my wife where they said you know on her deathbed they say wow we could have fixed this six months ago we could have fixed this easily just by doing this 
then why didn't you? You know, simple, obvious, easy, straightforward solution. You know, didn't do it. So, you know, to my mind, that's either at least malpractice if that's not, in fact, murder. Uh, where it was known, and it was possible, and it was cheap, and it was easy, and it was self-evident, and didn't bother. Didn't bother. Let her die. So, uh, I have no love for the medical establishment. I think they are murderous scumbags. Um, so even if I could theoretically go and see them, I'm disinclined to do so. Uh, you know, no need to go to see a murderer when, when you're trying to avoid death. As it happens, of course, um, I've had a lot of reason to look into this. I've, I've known a lot of people who have been through a cancer diagnosis. And certainly I've been try, you know, tried to be of what assistance I can be. Uh, at least telling them where they can go look for information, if nothing else. And uh, over the years, you know, it's it was... I mean, wading through the, the cancer issue is, is wading through a swamp. It's wading through a morass of, of garbage up to your neck and it, it is you know I've, I've had people say you know oh, if you're if you're such a healer why you know, why'd your wife die of cancer and on one level that's a reasonable question but on another level i realize that they've never had to deal with cancer they've never had to deal with the swamp that is the supposed treatment you know alternative treatments for cancer or treatments or whatever they have no clue just how much bull crap there is you know and so, you know, yeah, I have a track record where the first person who approached me about it, they died. Second person who approached me about it, they died. Third person who approached me about it, they died. My wife, which is the fourth person, she died. Now, admittedly, I came close. To, you know, I was able to extend her, uh, you know, uh, fight well over a year longer than the doctors said she had. So I was coming in, I was starting to come close, but I couldn't quite beat it. And then the next person, they recovered. They don't have cancer. And so they followed, you know, what I said, here's what you need to look into. Here's what you need to find out. This is the basic gist of it. Here's what actually seems to work. And so it's up to you, but you go do it. And here's what you need to look at. Don't don't look at this. Don't look at that. Don't fall for those other, other shit. This is what actually seems to work. And they 100% reversed the situation. So, you know, that's one, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, one possible success. You know, you can argue whether it was a success or not, but it was one possible success. So it gives me a certain amount of hope that in the process of losing, I've learned something about winning a little bit. And so, you know, I'm going to be doing that for myself now. And applying the knowledge that I've gained over these last 10 years of trying to help people and, you know, not doing so well. You know, it's one of those things, like I said, it's a, everything you think you know is, is probably not correct. And stuff that is actually works is not really well promoted. The stuff that doesn't work at all is heavily promoted. And, um... And so that's the thing, is unless you've actually had to get in the trenches and fight, you probably don't really realize what works and what doesn't work. And, of course, there's anomalies. You know, there's people who have recoveries despite whatever you do. And not necessarily because of it. Um, so, anyways, I'm kind of going to split this into two videos. I want to talk about cancer. And I want to talk about uh, what I'm going to be doing on a physical level. Because I know some of you show up for more worldly discussions and physical discussions. And that's where you're at. And that's fine. And there's a role for that. And there's a place for that. And that's cool. And then I want to do another video that's going to be talking about my spiritual perspective on this whole thing. Uh, which is going to be pretty far out. I'm going to probably no holds barred it. So it's going to be, you know probably pretty crazy and if you are materially minded you're probably just going to want to not even worry about it because it'll just sound all kinds of crazy to you uh but i recognize it's like well i'm in the process of learning the spiritual aspects i'm not really where i need to be yet i've definitely made some great headway but i've been indulged in this discipline for 
about five or six years now, and um, I'm just now starting to make a major breakthrough. But I'm not where I need to be yet. So, you know, it, and it may take me some time. Now, admittedly, I'm pretty sure that what I've got, all things being equal, I've got another 10 years, you know, maybe 15 years, maybe 20 years. I mean, bowel cancer can move pretty slow. This one seems to have moved pretty slow. It's starting to get kind of serious. I think it's actually something that's kicked it up recently. And that gets us into another subject matter uh, about what's accelerating cancers, because there is stuff that's accelerating cancers. And so I think that my situation may have been accelerated. Uh, so it, it, I may not have that long. And this is one of the reasons I'm going ahead and come out and say that I have the cancer, even though it's not diagnosed cancer from a doctor is I, I've had, I'm pretty sure I'm reasonably positive or, or extremely positive that it is in fact cancer. Um, because frankly, I don't know just how long I've got and I don't know if I'm going to win this fight or not. And if I just suddenly go poof and disappear, then people will wonder what happened. If they ever find out, they'll hear, you know, oh, he was sick or whatever. Why didn't he say anything? So I figured it's reasonable to come out and say, okay, look, I'm now, you know, I'm now reasonably confident that this is the case. You know, it, I've done a lot of research. Over the last couple of months, I began, became extremely suspicious about two months ago that it was cancer. I did a bunch of research into bowel cancer, which I thought was the most likely cancer. I then monitored my condition for a couple of months and saw what the consistent things were. And they fell very much into that pattern. So I am now pretty confident that that's what's going on. Uh, you know, not just kind of confident, but very confident that that's what's going on. So, uh, so I figure it's, you know, it's time to come forward and say, you know, this, this seems to be what's happening. So, you know, what am I going to do? You know, how did I diagnose it? Well, you know, that gets into some gritty and nasty details because we're dealing with the bowels. Uh, you know, generally I've had abdominal discomfort for a long, long time. Started out as uh, spasms of the, of the stomach muscles, especially, you know, uh, certain positions, of course. But if I was doing sit-ups or whatever, uh, you know, the m muscles would spasm, pressure otherwise discomfort particularly you know in the uh corner and I've, I've had my pancreas checked out i've had my spleen checked out i've had my lungs checked out they're all fine my stomach's fine there's no ulcers so you know we're kind of coming down into it's it's the bowels of some kind you know it's intestines bowels something like that uh, of course there's been issues uh that say something's wrong blood and what have you it's gotten considerably more extreme over the years. Uh, pressure's gotten a little bit more pronounced and intense, different things like that. Um, and there's you know, there's other other issues that are a little too gross to discuss <laughs> easily. You can easily look up the symptoms, and and you you know I've I've got quite a you know I've got at least four of the eight symptoms, and they are specifically suggestive that there's something going on with my bowels. So I, I'm very reasonably confident that we're talking about bowel cancer, you know, some, some sort of growth, some sort of an obstruction. Um, so, you know, that's what I've done diagnostically. Uh, it's not been a leap to condition uh, conclusion. You know, it's, it's taken me a good decade to come to this conclusion of consistent experience and particular observation over the last several months and so forth and very carefully weighing and measuring what I'm looking at and so forth. So what am I going to do about it? Well, of course, I can't tell anybody what else to do about it. I can't diagnose anybody. I can't treat anybody. I can tell you what I intend to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically, yes, I would prefer a spiritual solution to this. Uh, I'm just not in, I'm in the middle of a whole thing, which I'll explain in the other video as far as the spiritual stuff. If I was to actually go for a spiritual solution, I would actually have to derail what I'm doing, and I don't really care to do that. Um, you know, I suppose it's worth it to, you know, to say, it's like, I'm not really scared of being dead. Not that I necessarily want to die, but I'm not really scared of it either. I've been dead three times. You know, I've talked about it on this channel before. I have had three near-death experiences. 
I have had thousands of experiences of being out of my body in in the spirit and you know not dead but not in my body and I know without a shadow of a doubt that I persist after my death that my death is not my end um I'm intimately familiar with what parts come with me and which parts stay behind. And yeah, I know that this body and the personality that goes with this body and a lot of the knowledge and skills that go with this body will be lost to me. But I know that a lot of what counts most, my strong emotions, my, my emotions of, and, and, and my core personality is, remains perfectly intact. Uh, and I am not scared of where I'm going. I'm not even, I, I don't know where I'm going per se. I have some suspicions, but I have, I don't know for a fact where I'm going. But I, uh, I don't fear it in any way. Um, I don't, you know, I know I have allies uh, as well. You know, I have developed good relationships and allies. I have no doubt whatsoever that they'll continue to have my back in that mode of life as much as they have currently in this mode of life. Because it is just a different mode of life. Uh, to me, there is no, there's no end. There's no cessation. It's just a switch over from being focused in the body to being focused in the spirit. Not a big deal. So I don't actually worry about my death. I worry about how my death might impact other people. I worry about how it will impact my family. I worry about how it will impact my friends. I worry about how they'll manage some of these things without. You know, knowledge that I've gained specifically for the times that we find ourselves in, and if I'm <laughs> if I'm suddenly removed from the picture, well, it does seem mean that I kind of wasted my last twenty years, <laughs> twenty twenty five years, you know, learning the things that were needed just to be snuffed out right at the beginning of the whole process, which would be uh, ironic and annoying. So I worry about that. I worry about being here for people. I worry about helping people. I worry about that sort of stuff, but. Ultimately, you know, of course, each person's individual choices are beyond my control. You know, they can go and learn just as much as I went and learned. It's not, I didn't do anything special. I just was very determined about something. And I, and I, made, I, I chose to take an action, and most people didn't, haven't. But that doesn't mean that they can't learn, and that doesn't mean they need me. So if I was to pass away and not have the choice of, of, in the matter... You know, I would have to trust that they'll make it through, that they'll find a way. Um, so, you know, ultimately, I, there, there's only so much I can do. It's not entirely on me uh, what goes on. You know, and plus there's, you know, there's larger stuff going on than just the, you know, incidental stuff that we take so seriously. So, you know, ultimately it is what it is. And, and I can do what I can do and... And what I can't do has to just not be worried about. So I, you know, I, I come from a different perspective here. Is I, I don't, I'm not overly worried if I fail to succeed. Um, you know, it's just annoying, but not not the not the end of the world. Not the end of the world for me, anyway. So um, I suppose that informs my situation. It also allows me to say, you know, hey, I'm not going to panic. I'm not going to go running to the doctors. I'm not going to be getting the shot. I'm definitely not going to be getting the shot. And I'll tell you that one of the things people aren't really broadcasting out there, but doctors have put forward, is that those people who have gotten the stick in the arm, um, that the cancer rate increases fivefold, 500%. And so that people who had, you know, undetected cancers, much as I did until just recently, um, they get that thing and it blows up. And suddenly they have massive, you know, they, it jumps forward massively. And they were saying, you know, people who have reasonably slow growing situations that might take them out in, you know, eight months, a year, year and a half, two years. Now it's taking them out in like two months. And so fast that they're not even worrying about chemo. And so there's not enough time for chemo. And I think that that, you know, so absolutely, even if I was not hardcore against it, I'd be against it for that reason. It would, you know, prevent me from having any chance of having success. 
uh, uh, at dealing with this. So I'm definitely not doing that. Now, of course, we've been talking about they're spraying shit. And I'm more and more confident that that's true. Now, admittedly, some things have come up where apparently there, there are places they are not spraying. So, you know, from what I've heard from people living in the state of Maine, they're not seeing what we're seeing here in Pennsylvania. Uh, Alabama is reporting they're not seeing, at least northern Alabama is reporting that they're not seeing the same stuff we're seeing here in, in the state of Pennsylvania. So we can be highly confident that it's been noticed, the spraying has been noticed, and I've heard the reports back of it, that they are spraying in the state of Pennsylvania, they're spraying in the state of Ohio, they're spraying in the state of Washington, they are spraying in um, Illinois, they are spraying in North Carolina. According to reports that I've heard from people who have observed this and who observe the same people getting sick kind of pattern that exactly matches the sort of stuff we're seeing here. And then there's people saying, no, in our state, we're not seeing anything like that. So that's good. You know, there's at least places that they're not spraying. But of course, you know, and then based upon uh, tests that were done out in, uh, I believe it was Spokane, Washington, where they collected the rain and the snow and they took photographs of it, is that, you know, they're definitely the same stuff that's in the shot in the arm is in the snow and it's in the rain. So it's being put into the snow and the rain, which means they're spraying it. Um, and so even though I haven't gone and gotten the shot in the arm, I'm being sprayed with this stuff every couple of days. So I have to assume that this is probably one of the reasons why it suddenly has accelerated and become very noticeable and kind of become undeniable over the last two months is because I'm suddenly getting hit by all this shit that, you know, that the, uh, you know, the primary components are uh, some kind of a toxin, you know, what, what's being found, uh, what's being reported, reported, and I, you know, and this is actually, this came up recently. Is, um, it's some kind of a toxin and it's parasites. And the, I mean, that's the very interesting thing because I had some different feedback about this is that there was a friend of mine who went to an optometrist just the other day and he was talking about the to the optometrist and he says you know what do you think about all this stuff that's going on stuff like that and he says you know it's very very strange he says if the story that they're telling on the news was correct and if this was you know the little v word you know the v infection if this was v's i'd see it in the eye i'd see the effects in the eyes you know, I look in people's eyes all the time. I look, look in people's eyes every day. And I would see the effects in their eyes. And I see nothing. And my friend then said to him, he's like, well, I've got a friend, meaning me. I've got a friend who's pretty sure that it's parasitic. That there's a parasite involved. And apparently the optometrist's response was, interesting you say that. That would fit. So, we have not direct confirmation, but another person observing the same patterns that I'm observing and saying, yes, parasites, no to the V infection word. I think that when, when, the thing, when an infection takes hold after attack by the other issues, it's whatever's opportunistic. So it's your local cold or flu or whatever you happen to bump into. It's food poisoning. It's, it's whatever you bump into. It's just that your rent, your immune system has been depressed and there's enough irritation and inflammation in your body that any sort of infection you run into is just is opportunistically snagged up uh, very readily. So that it's not that anyone's spraying a V or any sort of bacterial infection or anything like that. They're putting out something that creates a lowered immune system that makes you vulnerable to whatever you run into. Um, and so there was that. And then also one of my hypotheses was, hypotheses was, okay, it appears that what's happening is coming in through the atmosphere. It does not appear to be from human to human contact. It takes the form of a toxin, you know, a toxic exposure. 
It has some elements that look kind of parasitic, and it responds to parasitic treatment. And it seems to respond to any parasitic treatment, not just one parasitic treatment, but a lot of them have some response. Uh, in fact, it have potentially a very extreme response. There's good reason to believe it's in the atmosphere. However, let's test that. And how can I test that? Without taking direct samples or, you know, catching them in the act or whatever, how can I test that? So we say, okay, well, let's think about this. And if it's in the atmosphere, if it's being sprayed, then it should absolutely be affecting the animals in the wild, wild. Possibly the plants too, but certainly the animals. Certainly at least the mammals. So we should be seeing some kind of effect in the deer herd, some kind of an effect in, you know, groundhogs, squirrels, mice, things like that. That, at the very least, mammalians, dogs, foxes, whatever, should have some kind of an impact. It should, as it seems to be affecting other people, be affecting their heart and be affecting their lungs. And it probably will also be affecting their neural tissue and it may also be affecting their liver and kidneys. But primarily, it seems that the primary effect is on the heart and lungs. And so back at the beginning of November, I'd said to everybody, it's like, okay, as you go out hunting, let me know. What do you see? Do you see a lot less deer this year than you've seen every other year? Are they behaving strangely? Is there behavioral changes? Um, are When you take a deer and you cut them open, what do the heart look like? What does the lungs look like? And so forth. And I really didn't get many answers. I got some answers back at the beginning of uh, November before anybody had been out in the woods. And a lot of it had confirmed what I'd already knew, which was the bird population is down, the bug population is down, the, you know, a lot of the small animals are down and so on, which I know, I've, I've known that's been going on for seven years now. So it's hard to know whether that was a sudden acceleration of a trend that other, everyone else is just noticing and I, I started to notice years ago. So I didn't feel that that was very conclusive. But a friend of mine got to talk to a um, warden, the park warden, at a game preserve here in Pennsylvania. And he says, uh, and he asked the question for me. And he said, you know, I've got a friend who's wondering. And he says he thinks that there's something weird going on. And so are you guys seeing anything weird with any of the animals? And the guy's like, yeah. A lot weird and he was saying that you know birds are dead small animals are dead the you know, there's a turkey kill off there's a deer die off to about 30 percent of the pot herd um, that there's they're finding corpses all across the game park every day and that uh, they're very concerned about this they've now been told by their bosses to not handle the corpses, and if they do have to handle the corpses, to have full PPE, personal protective equipment, uh, that it's very, and that, that they're keeping it on the quiet because they don't want to spook everybody. Ha <laughs> ha, you told me, bad move. Um, and that when they do autopsies, the lungs and the hearts are inflamed and filled with fluid. So, here is a point of confirmation that says that somebody, not the same guy, but somebody was suggesting that they're blaming it on chronic wasting disease, and they're now saying that 90% of the deer herd has chronic wasting disease, which is a substantial jump. And now, of course, the thing is that the old shot in the arm, one of the side effects that is presumed to occur from this is human spongiform encephalopathy. It has neurological effects, Bell's palsy and Guillaume Blay and okay, mouth you want to Guillaume Blay, I think that's right. Uh, but other neurological partial paralysis, different things like that, and dementia, which is particularly human spongiform encephalopathy. Well, if you take spongiform encephalopathy and you put it in a cow you call it mad cow's disease if you take spongiform encephalopathy and you put it in a deer they call it chronic wasting disease so when they're saying that there's now chronic wasting disease suddenly in 90 percent of the herd potentially <coughs> pardon me and that um 
you know, it, it's it's spreading like crazy, and they don't know how, and it's, it's really hitting them, and they're also their hearts and their lungs are inflamed, and so on. This is what we would call inexplicable through normal natural causes. But it makes perfect sense if they are spraying in the air some kind of a toxin and some type of parasites that are found is the same stuff that people found in the vials of the shot in the arm. Now we don't know either one of these, what they are. Uh, we don't know for sure. We assume that the toxin is um, got to write it not I can't say it we assume that the toxin is that we don't know that for a fact people out in Spokane said they found gobs of it in in the snow huge amounts of it in the snow and water so maybe maybe not i'd really want validation of that i want to see a lab actually analyze it and get absolute confirmation but the probability is pretty damn high and th and if that's true and if that's what i'm being exposed to yeah that accelerates that that has like a 20-fold acceleration on growths of cancer you know if, at least the five and potentially 20-fold acceleration that's why it's not allowed to be you know, humans it's not allowed to be used on humans because it's a super oxidizer. It attacks all the organs in the body and it super oxidizes them. So if you already have cancer, it gives it, it's like pouring rocket fuel on the fire. If you don't have cancer, it's like, you know, you might as well be taking cancer. You know, you're, you're taking an, you know, something that will induce cancer. So I don't know that that's the toxin in question that people are encountering. I mean, I know they're to encountering a toxin just simply from the, uh, you know, the triage of the symptoms of what they're talking about is they are the symptoms of a toxin. What toxin? I do not know. This is probably as likely the case as, as anything. As far as the parasites, we don't even know what the hell the parasites are. Um, and some of the parasites that were found inside the vials were identified as ones associated with the AIDS virus. But there's other ones that have been found that nobody really recognizes. Nobody's been able to confirm what they are. They are from the Hydra family. Uh, so they have, you know, a, a little, little stumpy body. And then they've got all these little arms coming off around, you know, presumably around a, a mouth. So they kind of look like that. Um, you know, to some extent. And they've been finding those, they found those in the vials, they found that in the snow, they found that in the rain. But the thing is that nobody knows exactly what they are because they don't quite match anything that's on any of the books. And we don't know what it does to people and we don't know anything like that. We do know, though, that, you know, symptoms match parasitic issues and that antiparasitics seem to provide some relief for people. So this is where it goes into the horsey I word and into, but pretty much everything, including fenbendazole, including uh, black walnut, including wall, uh, uh, wormwood, including uh, sweet wormwood, including most things that have a, some sort of a vermifuge uh, capacity all seem to be having at least some beneficial effect. So here's the problem is that now I've got not only the condition of having cancer, I probably have cancer and it's being there's you know stuff being put into my body through possibly food possibly water now I drink only filtered water so hopefully the stuff would be taken out through the water but I can't swear it's not in food that I eat uh, I know that there was a lot of rumors last spring about that being found the stuff is being found in food and, and it was being put into animal feed and then given to pigs and cows and stuff like that and then when they were slaughtered, it's in their bodies, it's in their meat. And then we're eating it. So I could be eating it very easily. Um, I don't know that for a fact. I, you know, nobody knows that for a fact. They'd have to have each thing tested to verify whether it did or it didn't. But, you know, a lot of people have been saying it's in the food, it's in the water, it's in the air. I know it's in the air. Very clearly and obviously it's in the air. So I not only got to fight, I've got to fight against the rocket fuel version of this shit. Which is one of the reasons why I'm a little bit concerned. You know, if it was just the thing itself, um, I probably wouldn't be worried at all because I, I've learned enough that I, I would be very confident 
of at least not at least stopping its growth. You know, whether I could actually get 100% full remission or not, I don't know, but I know that I would have extremely good chances of stopping its growth. Start pouring rocket fuel on it. Who freaking knows? Now, my approach for this, people may be wondering. Generally, I have. Uh, I have a th kind of a threefold approach to this sort of stuff. Um, so, if I'm approaching anything, any Ill any illness, any unwellness, doesn't matter. Generally, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to try to stabilize the person's condition. You know, imagine somebody's stepped on a nail. Well, I'm going to isolate their foot. You know, I'm going to try to, I'm not, probably not going to pull that nail out. It depends on whether I can get them to an emergency room or not. I'm probably not going to pull that nail out because it's a puncture wound and who knows what it hit. And I, I pull it out, I could, you know, cause a, an arterial bleed or a venal bleed or something like that, which would be a serious issue. So I might leave it in there. So, but I need to stabilize the foot and I need to stabilize the person's condition, <laughs> deal with their pain issues, deal with bleeding, make sure they're not continuing to bleed or the be bleeding is minimized, all these different things. The basic first aid, you stabilize the patient. That's really what first aid's only thing to do is to stabilize the patient long enough to get them to an emergency room where they can receive proper care. So the first step in all this sort of stuff, you run into an issue, whether it be, a, you know, a serious metabolic issue like the one I have or whether it be a disease issue or whether it be a traumatic injury uh, and and that sort of thing is to stabilize the person's condition. Now I'm quite certain now in retrospect that when I've been trying to talk to people about what I know having learned from herbs and stuff that when the herbs fail it's generally because they got outcompeted by the disease, and that's because they didn't sta because the person didn't get stabilized first, and this is a big issue with cancer, and it's actually a long established thing with herbs. If you're using the herbal approach, not all herbs, but many herbs take a long time to build up in the system and have their effect. Like there's certain e herbs that will help to ease or even reverse serious heart conditions. So if you have various different kinds of, uh, you know, clogged arteries or, or you know, former heart attacks or, uh, uh, or uh, uh, you know, uh, what do they call it? Um, you know, gaining the water, the, the, causing the water to shut off the heart. I'm drawing a blank right at the moment. Anyways, if you have these things, there are certain things you can do, but it's going to take at least six weeks before the stuff starts to have any impact whatsoever. So you've got to get the person through six weeks before you can kind of start to stabilize them. Well, now, if the person's in really serious shape, meh, they may not make it six weeks. And so this, this is one of the problems with herbs, is that herbs have a tendency to be slow in their action. And there's an age-old saying about herbs, and they said, you know, when you treat somebody with herbs, they have a tendency to die of the underlying disease. Where you treat somebody with pharmaceutical medicines, they tend to die from the treatment. Um, and oh, isn't that true? Is it more and more the older I get, the more and more true that starts to seem. So after that, after you stabilize, so the important thing is to figure out how to stabilize somebody and to hopefully have the time to actually achieve that end. The next thing you need to do is you actually have to address the issue itself. You know, in the case of cancer, of course, obviously you want to try to shrink the tumor and stuff like that, if at all possible. This could involve surgery, going to the doctor and having surgery. It could involve, you know, normal treatments, which ain't going to be what happens in my case. Or it, you know, you or there are herbs and things that will deal help to deal with that, provided that you've already stabilized the thing. So you've slowed or stopped the growth. So if this growth is going exponentially, 
you usually don't have time to do anything about it and the person's screwed. So the next thing would be, you know, so I, I, there's things you can do. There's, there's over 900 different herbs you can use that are going to have some level of effect uh, uh, in, in treating. And those, that's confirmed by research studies and all this sort of stuff. So there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of options. Now, there's some that are better than others, but there's hundreds and hundreds of options. And then, of course, you got to actually address the original cause. So, you know, something caused this to happen. You know, I came in touch with bad food. I have food sensitivities, maybe. There was maybe some sort of a, a chemical or environmental thing. Maybe it's emotional stress. Maybe it's something else. Something originated this in the first place. And, of course, now we know that, you know, the exacerbation of it is all this <clears throat> stuff that's going on. And so the last step would be that once, you, once you've got the thing stabilized, once you've perhaps reversed the condition or done something to try to treat the condition to some extent, you got to figure out what caused it in the first place and actually get that out of your life. I mean, a lot of people, if and when they get you know, a, a serious health issue reversed, they go out and do the exact same shit that they did that caused the issue in the first place. Well, it, you know, sooner or later, guess what? The condition reemerges or something very similar or related emerges. And so the thing is, you, you know, it's kind of smart to learn your lesson and deal with what may have caused the thing. So there's different things I'm going to do in, uh, in each one of these things. First thing, it's to stabilize. There's a couple of different things that uh, need to be done. And uh, the things that I have found that work, at least in my opinion, and the things that I will personally be using... Is prime, first and primary is going to be liposomal vitamin C, and I'm I I think I'm ter- currently taking well over three grams, and I may double that. Um, this is something that I did uh, learn from from when I was trying to help my wife, and at that time I had to manufacture the stuff myself because it couldn't you couldn't buy it. Now you can readily and easily buy it, a very high grade product. The thing was that I didn't find it out until the last two months, and it was too late. If I'd been able to get, you know, kind of shovel it down her throat, if I'd been able to get a beer bong and put it, put it to her at the beer bong, it probably still, it probably would have helped. But we were at a stage where it had to be that kind of aggression. It had to be not just a gram a day. It didn't, it had to be, you know, five, six, seven grams a day, something like that to... To have an effect. It was just too little too late. Since then, I've told people about this, and they have used it, and they've had excellent success. So, But the thing is to have this large, large, you have to use large dose. Um, you know, I've been, it's been explained to me, the metabolism's issue is that cancer spread, when cancer goes to spread, it hits uh, the stuff in between the cells. And that stuff in the in between the cells is loaded up with vitamin C, provided you have enough. And when it sends out something to try to spread, the vitamin C stops it. It kills it. But it uses up the vitamin C in the process. And so a lot of people have said, you know, hey, very interestingly, a lot of cancers look a lot like scurvy. And it's not that cancers are scurvy. It's that cancers cause scurvy because they eat up all the vitamin C as they spread through the body. So one of the things you can do to slow things down is make sure that your vitamin C is way up there. Uh, other things would also include um, uh, Vite D, Vite B, uh, Vite E. Um, Vite K, and potentially also Vite A. So all all of those, and I'm still trying to figure out the exact quantities, so I can't tell you quantities right at the moment. Another thing uh, that I've just found out is vitally important is sufficient zinc. And of course, zinc has the problem of that it's... um, you can take too much. And so I'm, again, trying to figure out just exactly how much I need to be taking. Oh, <clears throat> grab my cap for my pen. So I'm still trying to nail down the exact quantities. Uh, 
I'm already on the C and the D and the K, and I'm bringing those others on board as fast as I possibly can. So these are all things that can be done to just stabilize. That's not going to heal anything. It's not going to cure anything, but it does slow things down. And that's the key. Before you can try anything else, I mean, and they've said, you know, even even if you're going the standard route, chemo route, and so on, this really helps. Uh, so these are, you know, th this would be my first automatic go-to. Also is, you know, I have to throw into their diet, which is, uh, in this case, the primary thing is to limit anything that's uh, inflammatory. So anything and everything in the Solanaceae family, which is your tomatoes, peppers, uh, potatoes, and uh, uh, eggplants, anything in that family is out. They're all very irritating to the gut. Probably gluten, probably non-fermented milk uh, products. Um, anything soy needs to be pushed aside. Um, all those or anything like that. I, I check out the work of Dr. Gundry. I don't one hundred percent agree with God, Dr. Gundry, but he did a lot of work into foods that irritate. And there's no question that, you know, irritation and cancer are very closely associated with each other. So the more you can reduce the irritation, which is part of what vitamin C is for and so on, the more you can do this. And the other thing is, too, is that if they are spraying stuff in the air that is oxidizers, you got things like vitamin C, which is an antioxidant. So it helps to get rid of, it helps to purge the stuff. The only problem is it's going to use up the vitamin C. So it argues for taking even more. And that's where we get into something perhaps also like using C60 and EVOO. Now that's carbon 60 in extra virgin olive oil, which I've got right here. This is C60 in olive oil. Uh, so that helps. That's got like 120 times the power of vitamin C. And yet it doesn't quite do all the things that vitamin C does. So they can work very excellently in concert with each other. But you, you can't replace one with the other. You need, you need them both. And that helps get all the toxins and everything out of the body. And it helps to reduce inflammation. So there's a lot of good reasons to want to try to add some of that in there. And that's just for stability. I mean, this is... And to some degree, the... the, the um, uh, it's not a treatment, but it does help to remove the claws because it's a detoxer and it helps to stabilize the issue because it helps to reduce inflammation. And so it's, but it's by no means, it's not, not a cure. It doesn't stand alone. None of, none of these things stand alone. You know, there's no one magic pill that, that does this. So I have found. If there's anything that comes close to that, it is vitamin C. I know that uh, Arborvitae T which is very high in vitamin C, has been used successfully by some people to deal with things. I, one of my teachers had uh, lung cancer, and she used Arborvitae tea and drank it all day, every day. Uh, another, you know, so that, I don't have access to the white cedars here. I no longer live where they grow. Um, and another one, of course, is also the chaga mushroom. Which is also a zinc ionophore, so it helps the zinc incorporate into the body, which helps to do all kinds of different things and so on. So that, that's another, and she also used the chaga as well. So all these things, that, that's just stabilizing. That doesn't cure a damn thing. It just stabilizes stuff. And particularly if we're, we're in an environment that is untoward, I mean, it's going to have to pump it up, you know, pump it up a lot because I'm fighting a, a really, you know, a battle that's at least 500 times harder than or I mean five times harder at least five times possibly 20 times harder than the battle my wife fought so I hope I learned pretty freaking well or else I'm kind of screwed um so there's all that that would be a number one these are that's the thing I would do to try to stabilize my situation uh so then there's the issue of treat the issue well, that, you know, that would be some sort of a cancer destruct or a tumor destructive compound, which could be so many different things. In my instance, I'm going to be using finbendazole, uh, which I'm getting human grade finbendazole over the counter. It's legal. It's readily available. You can go to Fenben Labs, and they, they manufacture a very pure product and so forth. You can find out all the information, how it's used and stuff online very easily. 
it's the tests indicate that it's probably the most potent of your options but there's plenty of other options which includes you know there's a lot of argument about thc and cbd but if you can get a you know a good all-around uh cannabis oil uh many people find that that works and it did not work for my wife but many people find that that works uh there's dandelion root uh dandelion root and leaf tea or powder uh there's garlic of course there's turmeric and cur curcumin you can get the cur it's better to get the curcumin tablets because the curcumin is the part that works and you have to eat a shit ton of turmeric to actually get enough to actually have any effect so better to get the concentrated version of the curcumin um you can you know uh, uh ginger um uh, is another big one um blueberries uh, uh was it b13 uh which is uh apricot or or, or uh, peach pits you know uh eating pit peach seeds um if it's one you can get to you can use hydrogen peroxide uh there's all kinds of things like i said there's over 900 tested compounds that have some sort of level of an effect you know nettles you know stinging nettles and and all kinds of stuff chaga of course big one turkey tail mushroom uh birch polypore um you know i could just go you know there's there's a lot i could go on and on uh, a lot of compounds that have some effect on helping to shrink the tumors now whether they're going to work for you that one's going to work for you the problem with most of them is again they're too slow so if you have a situation, the, the situation is going to drive out of all, you know, it's going to blow up out of all control, even though you're taking these items. And so a lot of people who are taking these items, they are, you know, they're, they're fighting a flood with an eyedropper. And it's just simply not enough. And that's why it's so important to work on sta stabilizing first, in my opinion. Um... And that is the big failing I what happened with my wife is that I was doing things that should have helped her and it did help her. Hence, she got an extra year or year and a half of life. But in the end, she was overwhelmed because I didn't I didn't know about stabilize at the time. And then of course remove the cause. Remove the cause. Well, that's going to be you know monitoring my diet and that's going to be things like C60 for detox that's going to be you know various different other issues uh making sure there's certain foods in my diet like uh, uh anything from the um uh broccoli the cucurate uh, um um oh, i'm drawing a blank again anyway any anything from the cabbage family um which is broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, you know, mustards, anything from the mustard family, things like that should be. And now that's pretty much in my diet every day already anyways. But that would be one way to go. Different things like that. The And, and of course, maintaining the antioxidants, even after potentially anything, any condition is removed, remain, maintaining antioxidant because you want to, you know, there was obvious oxidation issues or else I wouldn't be, be here in the first place. So I have to address the, as an ongoing thing for antioxidants to try to start to reverse some of that damage. So this doesn't just come right back because there in lights the problem is I can, I can use these compounds and possibly get rid of the tumors, at least one hopes I can. Um, but that doesn't mean that even once they're gone, that I thought if I stopped and go back to my normal way of life, this may just reemerge or another one might reemerge from, you know, so I'm not, next time it might be bone cancer or brain cancer or lung cancer or any number of other things. So, you know, a cancerous condition exists in my body and I have to continue to be very aggressive about keeping things, uh, keeping the antioxidants up, keeping the irritants down and so on. And that's just gonna be the case for years to come, possibly for the rest of my life, however long that happens to be. So that is the approach that I currently have. That, that is the best of my understanding at the moment. Now, I constantly continue to research. I constantly continue to study. I constantly continue to try to see what works for other people and try to, you know, make that make sense. This is my best understanding of the moment. You know, as far as diet, you know, it probably better to go um, ketogenic. 
you know, if uh, it wouldn't be bad to think about a three-day fast to reset the immune system. I'm not sure whether I'm going to be able to do that in this current situation or not, but that wouldn't be a bad thing to consider. Uh, ketogenic is preferred, but of course the idea there, you really want to get clean meat because a lot of things like the growth hormones and so on that are in commercial meat, they work on cancer too. So they actually are cancer fuel. Uh, I know already from experience that the vegan, raw vegan diet does not work for me anyways, and it didn't work for my wife necessarily because we tried that. Uh, and I know that it does not sit well with me at all because it's considerable intestinal upset, and that's definitely not what I'm looking for right now. Um, at the same time, you know, having uh, additional uh, insoluble fiber and stuff like that, I am dealing with a bowel issue, so bowel health is not only important for the immune system, but it's important overall. So I might start taking pectin in tablets, get some powdered pectin, or I might get uh, powdered uh, uh, plantain. You know, both of them have a lot of insoluble fiber. Plantain, uh, plantain seed hull is what's in Metamucil. You know, it's an insoluble fiber. So you can get the plantain has a lot of mucilaginous. It helps to reduce uh, inflammation. Uh, it's cooling. It's soothing. It helps with open wounds, healing open wounds and such. And uh, the hulls have this insoluble fiber. So some sort of a whole plantain plant compound I might start putting that into my food or I might start taking it in tablets or something like that. I think that that might help a lot and or pectin. Um, you know, of course, pectin comes from apples and a number of other fruits and it's an insoluble fiber. It's very soothing and all these other things uh, that helps to, to deal with uh, irritation and so on. And the insoluble fiber helps with your gut biome. So that's probably going to be a very, very big, important part of this too. So... You know, also at the same time, like I said, you know, I will be approaching this from a spiritual perspective. Already have started, and in fact, I've, you know, part of my, you know, part of my awareness that this is happening was the fact that I had the spirits show up and said, Psst, you know, you've got a problem," and they kind of showed me vision-wise what was going on in my body, and you know, of course, I didn't take that at face. Like I said, you never take a vision at face value; you check it. And so, but I respect that. I mean, when that comes in, and especially when it comes in twice, I know my body or my spirit or spirits in general are trying to tell me something. And then, but then the question is, what precisely? Where is it precisely? Where, you know, what's going on precisely? Because that may alter how I choose to approach things. Um, and so there was still like two, three months of research and self-observation to confirm what they had showed me and to to verify that it was what it was and where it was. And so, you know, I, I'm now quite sure that they were telling me the absolute truth. And so there are issues, there are spiritual issues, but at the same time, like I said, I'm, I'm in the middle of a intense spiritual discipline that I do not want to put down. So I'm not willing, ready, or able to redirect in that way. So... You know, that leaves me with the physical. And, and the same thing, too, is that even if I was to approach this now physically and or spiritually and try to do a spiritual uh, approach to this, I would still do this while I'm working on the spiritual stuff, too. Because, again, stabilize. I want to stabilize my condition because maybe it takes me, you know, two or three attempts. Maybe it takes me 30 attempts. Maybe it takes me 100 attempts before I get it really ring the bell. And that can happen. You know, sometimes you, you, you try and you've got issues, you know, whether you're going the ayahuasca route or whether you're going, you know, some other route or whether you're going a, a meditative route, visualization route, whatever it is, is that you may not always ring the bell on the first go. In fact, that very often you don't ring the bell on the first go. A lot of people say, you know, it maybe takes 30 days, you know, or maybe it takes two or three, you know, depending on how you're approaching, it may take two or three tries. Um... You know, if you got somebody who really knows their stuff, maybe you can ring the bell on the first try. But doing it for yourself is is tricky, and so it may take a little bit till you hit that just right. And so in the meantime, you want to stabilize everything so things don't get worse, and you want to start detoxing, and you want to start you know giving your body what they need, what it needs that it's been lacking, which led to this problem in the first place. And so there's still the physical approach too. You know, personally, I see them, I mean, I don't, unlike most Westerners, I know in the West, 
we are encouraged to see the body as the enemy. You know, spirit good, body bad. And, uh, you know, body is corrupt, and therefore the body is evil, and that the body is a problem, and the spirituality is the good thing, all, all 100% awesome. And I have very deep issues with that. And I feel like, you know, to express ourselves spiritually, we need the body, and we need our spirit. And so fixation on the body is just as uh, toxic as fixation on the spirit alone. Is it? It's, we are an integrated being. And so it makes sense to do things approached through the body and through the spirit at the same time, a holistic type approach. And so, you know, I don't, I don't really get into this whole, you know, ignore the body, just focus on the spirit. You know, it, undoubtedly it works for some people, but I, I personally say, you know, love the whole system, deal with the whole system, be kind to the whole system, work together with the whole system is all, and, and, you know, when you're working with spiritual healing, that sort of um, compassion goes a long way towards engendering success. To show compassion, to have compassion, to be nurturing, to be loving, goes a long way towards engendering success. And so to have this sort of negative view of your body, I mean, a lot of people who go, like, say, through the ayahuasca route, they're dealing with issues. What are they dealing with issues? Their fear of death their, you know, body dysphoria or body, bad body imagery or, or, you know, prior illnesses, prior trauma, abuse, you know, various different, the sexual assault, different things like that. These traumas that have clung on to them and have come out in the form of some sort of a, you know, body dysfunction. And it's the ayahuasca that then goes in and allows them to confront and release this emotional trauma, whatever it may be, that actually allows the body to finally be come to its balance and and find some solution where the thing problem goes away, when it works, <laughs> and it does work sometimes, but when it works, and so there is that, and the thing is that you know you have to it, there is your your there's your body there's your psychology, you know your emotions and then and your, there's your spirit and you should be you know paying attention to all of these. And paying compassion to all of these, and be willing to pay compassion to all of these. And of course, the big thing is not to fear death. And I'll probably get into that in the next video, where I talk more about the spiritual approach to things, is that, um, you know, death is obviously, I mean, that's one of the things you notice when you say to some people, you know, oh, I probably got cancer, or I've got cancer, or whatever. And everyone's like, oh, I'm so sad for you, and they go... And they disappear, you know, it leaves a little ring of smoke as they just head off in every direction as fast as they can go. And of course, I saw, I watched this happen to my wife, and it was much more devastating to my wife, because she was much more socially oriented than I am. I'm, I'm very much a lone wolf type. And so when it happened to her, it was devastating. But it's everybody else's fear of death, is that once they know that this person is in risk of death, they want to get as far away from it as they possibly can. And so they leave the person in the dust right at the moment they need the most love, compassion, help, and, 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 and uh, society, community, as possible that everyone runs for the hills. And, uh, you know, to some degree, I've, I've <laughs> seen this happen with, for me, too. I came out and said, yeah, okay, I've, got, I've probably got cancer. And immediately people are like, well, uh, so long to you. I'm sorry to hear that. Bye. You know, and they run for the hills. This is fear of death. And now the thing is for me, and, and my wife did not have near-death experiences. She did not have the comfort with death. And she borrowed from my own confidence, some confidence for herself. And yet she didn't know it in her heart the way I do. And so for her... It was a death sentence. It was it was having to confront death for the first time in her life. And it was quite devastating for her. Now, admittedly, she was an exceptional woman. And she got over it. And I think in many ways because I was there to help her with it. And, and it's not that big of a deal for me. So, but at the same time, it was an issue for her. And it was, it was something that had to be dealt with. The fear of death. The fear of dying. And the thing is that most everybody around you has that fear. And so, you know, for me, I don't have to deal with my fear, but I have to deal with the fear of everybody around me. 
you know, and that's that can be just as hard because, you know, friends, loved ones, so on, suddenly are having panic attacks on your behalf. You know, I, yeah, I'm not having a panic attack, but they're having absolute panic attack. And now you got, you know, at the moment when you need help, at the moment when you need companionship and kindness, you're having to be the nurse for everybody else who's not injured, but the very thought of death just sends them into hysterics. And so you've got to be there for them right when you actually need them to be there for you. It's very cruel. It's, it, it's an, an, an insensitively cruel uh, behavior that our society has given to us, this fear of death. And um, it's perverse. It's perverse. And it definitely, there's no question it leads to uh, escalation of these conditions, is the emotions, whether the person has the fear or whether they have to deal with the fear of everybody around them. You know, I remember one my one of my best friends died of cancer. And uh you know, it was he was getting close to the end. He he he'd gone the chemo route um and it did what chemo often does, which is it shrunk the primary tumors to a degree where the doctors were willing to say remission. And then he had all of about, you know, two months or so, and it came roaring right back. But now it was brain cancer and liver cancer and bone cancer and, and all cancers all over the place. And this is very common uh, from what I've read and from the studies I've looked at. This is a very common result of chemotherapy. And so, you know, he'd gone through the chemotherapy and he got this result, which is uh, not surprising at all. And so, you know, now he was in a lot of trouble and, you know, and chemo was right out of the question. And, you know, he was about to, you know, they were about to go into the uh, radiation therapy and so on, just trying to slow it down, just giving him a little more time and stuff like that. I was trying, finally, at that point, he started to say, you know, well, what have you heard of about alternatives? And, of course, in that case, we never got to try any alternatives. He decided to go the main route. As actually, when I say, you know, I talk to somebody and they die, they talk to somebody that they, every, all of them eventually turn, chose to go the normal route, the, the allopathic route. And every one of them died. Uh, whether they actually took any of my words uh, to heart or not, I doubt. So I can't really put that on me, but because in, in almost every case, the people did not listen to me anyway. And every one of them is dead. Now, I don't know that if they'd listened to me, they would be alive. That I can't draw that conclusion, but I know that they chose to go the normal way, and every single one of them's dead. I mean, everyone's got this story. I know my aunt, she ate grapes, and she's alive. Yeah, well, I've got this story about everyone who's done things normally, that every single one of them is dead. And um, so, <laughs> you know, take that to mean what you want. But he was, you know, he was in the hospital, and of course it was getting near the end, and he, he was, uh, you know, he was going in for the radiation therapy, and he was scared. He was terrified because this had come back. He thought he'd beat it. He thought he had his life back. Now it comes rip-roaring back, and he and it's everywhere, and it's in his brain, and he's worried, you know, he, he doesn't know what's going to happen, and so on. And every person who came to visit him was crying and weeping, and he was forced to hold them and tell them it was okay. He wasn't feeling it was okay. He wasn't sure it was right. He was in serious need of support, and he had to support everyone else. And he felt very, very aggrieved about that. And I don't blame him. And he told us all this because when my wife and I came to see him, I was busting his chops, and I was telling dark humor jokes, and I was making him laugh, and I was helping him to see humor in the situation, and he loved it. You know, it made all the difference. He was saying, you know, thank you for not being like all of them who can't stop crying. You know, they're already at my funeral. And that's, you know, and that's so much the way it goes. And it's not helpful. It's not helpful at all. And I know it's an artifact of the culture. I know people don't mean to do it. It's, it's not malicious. It's their own fears. They've never come to terms with the whole issue. Our society does not help people come to terms with the issues. And, you know, he was a very, very well-loved person throughout the community and everything like that. So he had a lot of friends, and a lot of them were quite quite useless. Um, so it was, it was a, it was a shit show. 
It was an absolute shit show. And that and to some degree, you know, I recognize now again, thankfully, yeah, I'm lone wolf. I have very few people. I and and the few people I do have, having gone through it with my wife, I know who my rocks are. I know who my foundations are. I know who I can count on one hundred percent. But I have a lot of other people around too, and I know that they're they're you know, they're either gonna disappear now or they're gonna be actually, you know, millstones around my neck. And uh, that's not helpful. And so actually I may well, I mean, I'll keep doing videos and stuff, but I may well kind of just pull back even more than I already have been just because, you know, I don't need that. That, that That's, you know, that doesn't help the spiritual healing. That doesn't help the body healing. That doesn't help emotional healing. It is, you know, might as well be a poison pill. And nobody needs that shit. So anyways, this is a situation. This is what I'm going to do. Um... No, I'm not going to get fully diagnosed by a doctor so I can hold up a paper. I don't really see the point. Like I said, it would take at least a year for me to get the diagnosis. Then they'd want to run me through chemo, which I'm not going to do. And um, and so and then, then the thing is that if I managed to, to reverse this situation and go into remission, they would just say, well, it was a bad diagnosis because <laughs> I've played this game before. They'd say, oh, well, it was a mistake. It was bad. It doesn't matter. I got the charts. I got the pictures. Here it is. It's highlighted and everything like that. And here's the tests and the lab work, the blood work, everything like that. It shows very clearly, uh, well, nope, it was a mistake. We obviously were mistaken because you couldn't possibly have gone into remission if you'd actually had a real condition. So, you know, to my mind, what value are they? You know, the only the only value they are, it, it would be nice to know, it's like, okay, you know, you've got a five centimeter tumor. And then go back in six months and say, well, geez, wow, amazing. It's now a half of a, you know, it's now a half a centimeter or a centimeter and a half tumor. And then go back six months later, it's like, I we can't find any tumors. That would be very helpful. You know, I'd like that. I'd like to have that diagnostic to know how to gauge my success or failure um, that would be nice, but I can't trust them. I can just simply cannot trust them to, number one, be honest, and number two, not to murder me. Um, I'll, maybe with good intentions, but murder me. And so, uh, I will not be getting a diagnostic, and I will not be, you know, I will have to do without their, that. I will just have to do the best I can without that. So anyways, that's the situation. I will do another one of these videos. I will talk about the spiritual approach. Those of you who are more materialists who've tuned in to hear about what's going on in the world and stuff like that, don't even worry about it. It's going to be way over the top. It's going to be talking about all kinds of deep shamanic stuff that um, that probably very few people are even ready for. But I'm just going to, you know, who gives a shit? I'm going to, I'm going to unload. <laughs> so that, that video will be up in a while. i got to recharge the equipment and everything before I can make another video. Uh, so I'll get this one loading and, and then maybe later tonight I'll make the next one, uh, if that works out or within the next day or two, I'll make the next one. 